In this presentation, we're going to have a look at attribute-based attribute, attribute -based encryption, and especially focused on what's called uh, cipher policy uh, attribute-based encryption. So the two main types of access control that we have are role-based access control. So for this, we typically use uh, the operating system and uh, an Active Directory infrastructure to be able to define uh, a subject and a role. And then with these, we then map these to permissions. So we might, on a Unix system, allow read and write, read, write and execute uh, attributes for an owner, say Bob, uh, and then Bob is in a group, say staff, and then we also have uh, permissions that will look at uh, everyone else outside that, that group. So this works fairly well, but doesn't scale uh, and, and is difficult to uh, add in other uh, attributes around an identity. So increasingly, we're looking at uh, attribute-based access control. With this, we can define a policy and we can use any attribute about uh, the user, uh, the resource, uh, any action that, uh, that they're performing or within uh, any context. So for that, we can start to write, map these to our permissions. So if it's Bob, we make sure that Bob adds, say, a certain role and he was also part of a department uh, and he was performing uh, an execute level uh, from a certain uh, IP address. So in this way, we can start to write uh, fairly uh, robust policies. Our key, the key part of this is that we need to make sure that these attributes are gained in a trusted manner. So we would make sure that anything we received in terms of an attribute was properly signed by a trusted authority. So in this way, rather than using identity and role-based encryption, which typically focuses on uh, usernames and passwords and through an Active Directory infrastructure, we could have trusted ab uh, validators to provide attributes. We can also get our attributes from our Active Directory infrastructure. But then what we can do is we can define the access control based on these attributes. And at any time we can actually revoke access or allow access. So it can become dynamic. So the method that we we'll look at uses elliptic curves and it uses what's called pairing uh, cryptography. And with the elliptic curve, we have a curve uh, it has a certain uh, mathematical equation, y squared is equal to x cubed plus ax plus b. Uh, so typical values are x equals uh, b, a is equal to 0 and b is equal to 7. So we have a point on the elliptic curve and then we draw a gradient and we can create a public uh, key as the point at which uh, it reaches the, uh, uh, which it, it cuts the, the curve uh, again. So we end up with scalar values and with x, y coordinates such as these two uh, here. We also have what's called an, uh, an n value which defines our, uh, our finite field. That's a prime number. All the values that we have will be constrained within uh, 0 and that number minus 1. So this is a typical curve that we use here. Uh, this is the name of it. And there's the A and the B parameter. Uh, this is the N value that we use. So all our operations are done mod of that. There's our point on the elliptic curve that we have. Okay. Uh, so this is what it actually looks like because we're using this uh, mod of a prime number. It ends up like this. So it doesn't look like our nice equation that we have here because we're using a prime number and a mod of any operation. This is what our, our, uh, our plot actually looks like for the x, y points. So the method of looking at uh, creates what's called a bilinear uh, mapping. 
So it's the way that it works, and we use two of these curves together to create another uh, curve. And when we multiply, uh, we have a mapping, a mapping function here. And with that mapping function, if we pick it correctly, we can take two points and raise one point to A and another point to V. And then with this equation, this mapping, that is the same as the point each point to the power of AB. And so this is the this is what's called the bilinear mapping and it allows us to create what's called uh, allows us to create our attribute based encryption. So the two main methods that we have are key policy attribute based and with this we define a policy for certain attributes to be able to create our key. The other one is ciphertext policy attribute encryption. And with this, we create a tree structure with different keys and then allow access given uh, the uh, various attributes. So within CBAE, we typically have these main uh, stages that we go through. A setup phase creates our public key, encryption and a master key. We then encrypt using this these public key parameters, our message, and with a number of attributes. So this will then uh, create our private uh, key that can be used as part of the uh, decryption process. We then create uh, this key, the key generation that's required if we take the master key and then uh, the attributes and we'll output our private key here. Next we'll, with these attributes and with the policy we can then uh, create our decryption key from here. We can also use a delegation function which will allow us to take uh, some of the attributes and to try them in the policy. So this is what we might have here. So here are two uh, attributes which are used within a policy. We then create our public key and use that in the encryption policy so that we embed the policy along with the cipher text. <coughs> the key gen function then produces our privilege key or our private key and then that's used within the decryption process. With this, we integrate in our policy uh, with the public key, and then that will produce the encryption key, which has been used to encrypt the, uh, the message. Typically, that will be AES of uh, 256 bits. So here's some of the code that we could use here. Uh, so there's the setup phase, there's the key gen, uh, this is the delegate function here that we're using and then we can try and encrypt and to decrypt. So the methods that we'll use is this one here in the in the in this example. So we can see here that we do our initial setup uh, with a new public key. We'll then generate our uh, pr private key here from the key gen. And then we'll go ahead and we'll encrypt uh, to find the, the key that we're going to use. So that will be the ciphertext and also the key uh, that is created here. So then this is the message and we also have embedded in the cipher policy. And then next what we can do is we can then uh, use our key that we've generated to be able to encrypt with the ES and then hopefully when we get our attributes we should be able to decrypt it back with uh, AES. So here is one example of how we can create our policy. So in this case we're using post order uh, traversal, traversal of threshold tree method. So this is a, an OR function and this is an, an AND. So in this case, we'll define staff, CSN 
0.09112 and admin as a part of our policy. So we define these as attributes. And now we're saying any two of these uh, will give us a successful uh, successful hit on the policy. Okay, so that's an or. So it's staff and this, or this and this, or this and this. So we start from here and we work uh, down. So over here, we now do a one of two root here, and then we do a two of three, which will give us this here. So in this case, we can have root, or we can have staff and admin. So in this way, we can actually define our policy in an efficient way. So here's an example here. So there's the message <coughs> that we're going to encrypt. And these are our attributes here. And then we can see here, for our attributes, we can have any two of these. That doesn't exist. Or we can have root. We can see here, as it's went through, it's been able to uh, encrypt, uh, uh, decrypt. So let's look at that uh, with an, an example. So let's say we have root here. And we can see here any two or three. So this won't work. And we can see that doesn't work. But then if we now add in root one of two, we should now be able to decrypt. We can see that as the case here. So if we come in and say we're staff and we have access to this module identifier here, then we're hitting this one here because we're providing two of the three attributes required. And we'll just change the message just to show that we're decrypting OK. And there we go. So we can see here, because we've got two of those attributes and we're doing a two of three, as we've seen from the tree, then we can uh, decrypt. But let's say that we're staff and we have these attributes. So this won't work because we have we don't have two of the attributes required here. OK, so in this case, we can't decrypt the policy. So the code, if you're interested, is uh, defined uh, here for that implementation. In the end, we define an exception uh, on our decryption process to be able to identify that we can actually uh, decrypt it. OK, so there's, there's uh, an example there. So we can see here that uh, we only we only have one of the attributes required here so that we can decrypt that policy. Over here, we can see that we can because of this root and we do the any one of two. So an application of this might be within, uh, say, healthcare. So in this case, uh, Bob has some sensitive information that, that he wants to keep uh, secret. But he stored it in his cloud infrastructure uh, and uh, it's encrypted with 256-bit AES. So no one should be able to get access to the data unless they have the encryption key. So Bob uh, posts his public key onto the ledger with his ID. So the public key is there to be able to be used um, to be able to get access to his encrypted data. Alice, who's his GP, will then try to access Bob's data. But Bob's data is defined by a CPABE policy for his health care. So at any time, uh, he can update this policy to define that Alice, the GP, uh, he trusts. He might say that she's only allowed to access for a certain time limit, say for one hour, or she would have to be logged in through the NHS or something like that. So Bob would be able to define the trust providers that he trusted and then also the policy that uh, he wanted access to. So if Alice goes away, Alice then goes away and finds the attributes required to be able to access Bob's data, 
but it might be that Alice has been locked out, so she, so we will not be able to, she will not be able to generate the encryption key required to access Bob's data. But if he does, he does allow access, and she provides the right attributes, then the encryption key is, is generated, and then a link to Bob's data is then released, and. Alice will be able to get back the access. But let's say she wants to write uh, data to it, then Bob can make sure that his policy doesn't include that action with inside uh, the, uh, uh, the access rights, and that uh, Alice would only be allowed, say, to read the, the data. So in this way, we can actually create a dynamic system where Bob can own his own data, but also secure it but then we'll define the policy, which is available on the blockchain, uh, to be able to define how, how his data is actually accessed. Okay, so that's been an example of uh, attribute-based encryption. You can have a look at the source code uh, on the website, and you can try a few of your own examples.